Hi, good afternoon. My name is Georgie. I'm from Midwest Optical Systems. Uh, we're located in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, so we've come pretty far uh, to uh, be with all of you. Thanks for being here. Uh, so today what I want to talk about is optical filters uh, and optics and how they can be used for your different applications to improve the quality of your application. Um, oftentimes, the filters are not thought of in machine vision applications. Right, you're selecting the camera, you're selecting the lens, you're selecting the lighting, making sure everything works, but then you don't even think about filters or you think about filters when you have maybe a problem. But my hope today is to talk to you about filters in a way where you recognize that filters are a necessity and not just an accessory. Now filters can be used for lots of different things, but today we're gonna to be focusing on how filters can help to improve contrast, resolution, and repeatability. Before I get into those things, I just want to go over some key terms. Um, so this is something called the transmission curve. Every time you purchase a filter or look at a filter, uh, you're going to have a transmission curve that lets you know which part of the wavelength or which colors are being passed, which part of the wavelength is being blocked. So there's some different elements to this transmission curve. Uh, this is called a pass band. If you've ever used a band pass filter, this is why it's called the band pass filter because it has a pass band. This lets you know what part of the wavelength is being passed. The next is called out of band. Uh, out of band lets you know what part of the wavelength is being blocked. So if I say a filter has very good out of band blocking, it means it's doing a good job of suppressing uh, potentially interfering wavelengths. This is called the transmission. All right, This lets you know how much of a wavelength is being passed. If I say a filter has very good transmission, then you know that it has, it's doing a good job of passing that wavelength or color or light, whatever you like to call it. This is called the full width half max. This refers to how wide the passband is. Uh, if you're using LED lighting, you want a passband that's wider. If you're using laser, uh, you want something that's narrower. So that width is called the full width half max or abbreviated as FWHM. So this is a transmission curve. Uh, again, it's letting you know what's being passed, what's being blocked. And that's what a filter does. A filter helps to block certain parts, wavelengths, and pass other ones. Um, so, like I said before, some of the words are cut off, so uh, sorry about that. We'll, we'll fix it for tomorrow, but if you have any questions about something, uh, please let me know or visit our booth downstairs. Um, so, filters help to increase contrast, uh, resolution, and repeatability. So first we'll talk about contrast. In machine vision applications, you're trying to create some kind of contrast. You're trying to uh, separate two different colors or separate uh, a part from the background or some writing on the actual part itself. And so you're trying to create some kind of contrast so you can, the system can read that part. Now, a lot of times, or in a lot of machine vision applications, we're dealing with monochrome systems, not colored cameras. Uh, in that first image right there, with the red and blue caps. Uh, in the color image, you can see that there's plenty of contrast. It's easy to tell apart the different colors. But in a monochrome system, you can see that it's much more difficult to tell which are blue, which are red. However, I can use a filter to create that contrast. Here in the bottom image, I'm using a red bandpass filter to pass red but block blue. And you can see that as I pass the red, the red bottle caps become highlighted. Uh, same here with the blue. I'm using a blue bandpass filter. I'm allowing blue wavelengths through uh, and it's blocking the red. So one simple idea is when you pass a wavelength or color in a monochrome system, it becomes highlighted. And when you block it, it becomes darkened. Okay, so passing highlights, blocking darkens. Uh, in fluorescence applications too, you can use bandpass filters to create contrast. Usually, if you're using a bandpass filter, you're uh, matching it to your light source. Okay, so if you have a red light for inspection, you have a red bandpass filter. If you get a blue light, you have a blue bandpass filter. But, but how about with fluorescence application? With fluorescence application, it's a little bit different. The common question I get is, well, do I get a UV bandpass filter for my UV light source? No, what, we're, what you want to capture is the emission, what's being emitted, not the light source. So here in this application, we have uh, a customer who is trying to read this code. They're using a UV light source, and this code is fluorescing. The A2 is fluorescing. 
but you can see that the emission is weak and there's glare that's actually being caused by the light itself. So here we use a blue bandpass filter. We use blue because the emission is blue, okay? So we pass the emission, but block the light that's causing that glare. So another easy way to create contrast in fluorescence application by passing that emission instead. Finally, one more way we can achieve contrast is by changing the background. Uh, we have uh, this new product. It's a wavelength conversion paper. Uh, this can be used as a background, uh, and you can put your part on top of it. The cool thing about this paper is that when you shine blue light, it fluoresces orange, and you can create uh, some uh, very good contrast background. So that first image there, orange paper, no light source. And then this is a monochrome image. I'm shining a blue light and using a orange bandpass filter to the system, it appears like it's white. Okay, so if you need an application where you need to create some background that's different from your part, or if you want to use a backlight but don't have space for the backlight, you can use this wavelength paper and a front light to create a backlight. So it's something new and very interesting that we're, uh, we're seeing a lot of inquiries about. So contrast. Next we have resolution. There's a type of distortion that occurs in lenses when the lens tries to focus uh, the different wavelengths of the same point. Because different colors or different wavelengths have different uh, refractive indexes, they bend in different points, um, the lens has a difficult time focusing all those different wavelengths. Uh, so there's, some, um, uh, there's a distortion that occurs called chromatic aberration and you lose some resolution. But if you only care about a single wavelength, uh, you can use a filter to filter out the wavelengths that you don't care about, and you gain some resolution. You can see the differences in the image here with no filter and with the filter. So easy way to gain resolution on your, on your lens, use a filter. Finally, we'll talk about repeatability. We call filters an inexpensive insurance policy. Uh, oftentimes, you set up an application in an environment like this, uh, you have a lab environment, you set up the application, the application is working perfectly, but then what happens? Well, you move the application to the customer floor, maybe to the factory floor, and things stop working. Because there's all these windows, there's lights, there's people walking around that you weren't aware of in this part. Uh, but if you had used a filter from the very beginning, if you had used a filter from your testing, uh, testing phase, you're controlling what light is entering the system, and uh, you're controlling uh, the effects of the ambient light. So regardless of the environment and what kind of lighting is there, if you use a filter, you're going to ensure that application is going to work regardless. So filters are a great way to ensure that, uh, that that's going to work. Uh, so let's, let's look at some more applications. Here's another one where uh, a customer was trying to uh, read this white date code. Um, this is the original color image. It's really hard to read, uh, even the color image, the monochrome image, without a filter. But here I use a blue bandpass filter. I use a blue bandpass filter to block the yellow, uh, but pass um, the white writing. Um, so uh, it's, it's a great way to, again, create contrast. When you're selecting a bandpass filter or any, any kind of filter, you want to pay attention to the design of the passband. Okay, there are filters that will be designed with a flat top uh, design, uh, but we would suggest selecting a filter, especially when you're using LED lighting, uh, to select one with a Gaussian or bell-shaped design. We find this design to be the most uh, efficient way to capture the LED, all right? The LED is being outputted with a Gaussian or bell-shaped uh, output, and so uh, a filter that has a Gaussian design passband is also one of the most efficient way to capture that. It also has uh, much better contrast uh, as well because it's blocking any uh, interfering wavelengths. Uh, something else that uh, you should be concerned about too is um, the passband shifting. Um, so what happens when light is coming into the filter at an angle at anything other than zero degrees, uh, the passband can actually start to shift. So you want to get a filter that's designed not to shift. Uh, traditional filters are created by taking glass, 
They apply a coating to it. That's how you create the passband. But you can find filters with a hybrid design uh, where the glass and the coating are both doing absorption and blocking. So that way, the passband doesn't shift. So why does this matter? Well, if you're using a red bandpass filter that's supposed to pass red light and the light is coming in at an angle, it's potentially blocking the red and passing green instead. Uh, so here's a quick example I have. So this is just a flashlight with a short focal length lens mounted, a three and a half millimeter focal length lens uh, mounted on the front. And because of the curvature of the lens, you can see that there's steep angles around the edges. Um, so what I'm going to do next is um, go ahead and take a bandpass filter, a red bandpass filter that has a normal uh, design, uh, a standard a dichroic coating on it. Um, and so this is, again, this is a red bandpass filter. So when I put the filter on and I turn the light on, what should you see? What color should you see? Red. You should see red. But what you can see around the edges because of the angles is you'll see green. That's because the passband is actually shifting. Okay. So what this means in real life is if you use one of these types of filters, you're actually blocking the red instead of passing the red that you want. Uh, so it's, it's a problem that you may not be aware of. Here's a filter that's designed um, to make sure that doesn't shift. Okay. You can see that it's red all the way through and doesn't change color or wavelengths. So something to keep in mind as you're selecting a filter. Uh, another uh, area of uh, interest in machine vision application is reducing glare. Glare is a common problem, whether you're looking at something shiny like aluminum or steel or something that's wrapped in plastic, glare is a constant issue. And you want to use a polarizer to help reduce that glare. Now, there's different kinds of polarizers available. There's a, a visible linear polarizer that you'd use with standard visible lighting. Uh, there are circular polarizers that you would use with cameras that have an in-metering lighting system, not typically found in machine vision systems. And then you have a wire grid polarizer. This is used if you're using an infrared light source. So infrared light source, you need to use a wire grid type uh, polarizer. A standard linear polarizer will not work uh, with infrared lighting. And you also have to make sure that you apply a filter to both the lens and the light source. Okay? Applying a filter to just the lens, a polarizing filter to just the lens or to just the light source is not going to be an efficient way to reduce glare. Let's take a quick uh, look at this example with the Bex beer bottles. Uh, here we have, uh, we're looking at this label. It's very reflective and very shiny, no filter. You can see that's difficult to see. We add a polarizing filter to the lens. You can see there's not much difference to the amount of glare. But then we polarize both the lens and your light source, and you can see there's a pretty significant reduction in glare. And then finally, we add a red bandpass filter. That's to get rid of some uh, last bit of overwhelming glare from the ambient light source. And you can see the drastic difference between image one and image uh, four uh, based, on, um, based on using polarizers. Uh, like I mentioned before, if you're using infrared lighting, you have to use a wire grid polarizer. Here I'm using uh, 850 nanometer LED, so it's an infrared light source. You can see the glare. If I polarize just the lens, not much difference, but polarizing the lens and the light source, you can see I get rid of that glare. So if you have an issue with glare, polarizers are the way to go. And uh, make sure you select the appropriate filter, uh, appropriate polarizer for your light source. Uh, for it to be the most efficient way to reduce the glare. Now, as you're selecting uh, filters, um, polarizers, whatever, you want to make sure that the actual optic is free of any scratches or digs. You want to make sure that uh, there's no stress in the glass because this potentially could cause some distortion in your image. Um, the way the filter is held inside the mount is uh, there's a retaining ring uh, that holds the glass inside the mount. Even tightening this glass too much inside the mount uh, can actually cause some stress in the glass uh, that can cause some distortion in your final image. Okay, so you may be doing an excellent job of 
getting a very good lens and very good camera, but then you choose an inexpensive uh, you know, $10 or $20 polarizer or filter, and it could ruin your whole image. It doesn't matter how good your lens or camera is uh, if you have uh, lots of issues with the substrate or with the glass that you can't tell from your eye, but there are methods to uh, inspect that. Um, another application that we're seeing a lot of um, interest in is NDVI. Uh, so NDVI uh, looks at the vegetative index or the health of different crops. So before, if a farmer wanted to look at the health of his crops, he would have to hire a pilot with a plane and a hyperspectral camera to fly overhead and take images and use software to, um, to determine the health of the plants, whether it's, a, it's a, a, a unhealthy, whether it needs more um, water, uh, but now, using multi-bandpass filters, uh, customers can actually use a, a drone um, and a GoPro and some software to actually read those values and um, uh, you know, determine the health of the plant. So it's a, a growing, trending uh, kind of application we're seeing uh, with these multi-bandpass filters. Uh, and, uh, we can also use these multi-bandpass filters um, in, uh, in, in ITS or uh, traffic or security or license plate recognition. Uh, because there's two bands, uh, you can use sunlight during the day um, and then infrared lighting uh, at night. Uh, so it's an easy way to, um, to, to use those applications with these types of filters. Um, because of these, uh, like in the drone applications, you're gonna need a lots of different ways to mount the filter to get your filter onto your lens. And so even the way, the different options that are offered are also important thing to consider. Uh, so whether you're screwing your filter onto the lens or you can put your filter behind the lens uh, or if you need something unmounted, uh, maybe glued to the back of your lens. You know, these are all important things to consider. Um, and especially in embedded, uh, embedded vision systems. Uh, embedded vision systems are usually um, small systems that are going on at the application site. Um, so this particular one um, is looking at which crops are uh, healthy, which crops are weeds or bad plants so that they can spray the weeds with the chemical. Um, and so this embedded vision system uh, is using filters to increase the image quality but also it needs a lot of protective windows or protective coatings or glasses uh, to protect because it's in an environment where there's uh, dirt and grease and grime. Um, so you wanna select a substrate, a type of glass that does a good job of protecting your lens or protecting your system. Uh, so you wanna get possibly a clear window or an acrylic window. Uh, these are different options that you might come across and they each have their own pros and cons. So if you need something very durable, something that's very scratch resistant, uh, you might want to go with sapphire. If you want something less expensive, uh, but still very protective, you might something, you want, want something like acrylic. Um, so regardless of the type of substrate or glass you select, we can apply coatings to them to improve the quality of the window. Uh, one type of coating is uh, AR or anti-reflection coating. Uh, when light goes through glass or goes through acrylic window, there's some immediate reflection that happens that causes um, some loss of light. Um, so what we can do is apply an AR coating uh, to make sure that reflection doesn't happen. Here's an example with the filter uh, that has no AR coating. You can see that the light hits and almost a, a lot of it is reflected back. Here's a filter with uh, an inexpensive single layer coating. This will reflect some light back. Uh, here's a filter with a broadband multi-layer AR coating. You can see that the amount of light that bounces back or is reflected is reduced. Uh, some other coatings that you can have applied is oleophobic. This helps to make sure that grease or oil doesn't stick to the surface. Uh, here I'm, I'm marking it with a permanent marker. You can see that the glass with the coating on it, uh, the oil from the marker doesn't stick to it, so it's very easy to be cleaned. That's uh, one option. Uh, if you need a hydrophobic cloak coating so that water doesn't adhere to the front of the glass, uh, this is another option as well, so that if you're in an environment with lots of liquid or condensation, um, these types of coating will prevent the water from uh, condensating like it, it is here. 
and you can see that it's not sticking here. So uh, lots of windows and protection that you can get. Uh, so I'm just going to move through the last couple of slides really quick here. Um, SWIR uh, wavelengths are becoming more and more popular. Uh, SWIR is very popular, especially for moisture detection. Uh, this actual application is um, using a standard camera, not a SWIR camera. Um, so I'm using a long pass filter to see how the water is being absorbed. So I'm using a standard camera with a long pass filter and uh, an infrared light. You can, you can see that because the water is absorbing the infrared, uh, you can see the absorption uh, of, the, of the liquid. Um, also, SWIR is a, a growing and popular way to look through uh, fog. This is a, an image of a mountain range uh, that they were trying to look at or take pictures of. Uh, there's two different mountain ranges here, but because of the amount of fog, it was very difficult to see. But because SWIR can almost see through fog because it can see the absorption, um, you can see that it's a little bit better, but because uh, of how SWIR absorbs everything, um, you can see that the trees don't look right and there's some detail that's lost. But using a SWIR bandpass filter um, and only looking at the part of the, of the spectrum that uh, is reflecting or absorbing, you can see that uh, the trees look much better. You can see the definition uh, in the ridges and the different parts of the mountain range. The last thing we get asked about a lot is how do I know what filter to select? Um, you know, that's where one of our kits, uh, it comes with lots of different options so you can test uh, with your different uh, filters on your lenses and cameras so that you can get an idea uh, of what kind of filter to select. Um, we're actually giving one of these filter kits away for free. Uh, so if you wanna come by our booth downstairs in the first room, uh, just come drop off your business card and we're gonna do a drawing and give one of, one of these kits away as a gift. So if you're interested in learning more about filters or testing, uh, you know, one of these kits are great. So that's my time. That was a lot of information in 20 minutes. And uh, if you have more questions, I think we have a couple of minutes now. Um, otherwise, please find me or my colleague, Mike, and I'd love to you know, talk to you more about those things. Thank you.